Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we're diving deep into a pivotal moment in computing history. We're talking about the language that brought computers to the masses, BASIC, and the trio of machines that truly ignited the personal computer revolution in 1977. You might know them as the 1977 Trinity, the Commodore PET, the Apple II, and the TRS-80 Model 1. But how did we get there? What role did BASIC play? And how are these iconic machines and their programming languages all connected? It all starts, believe it or not, with a magazine cover and a sense of urgency. It's the end of 1974, right before Harvard University's winter break. Two young friends, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, are looking for their big break. They knew the future was in software, but they were waiting on a personal computer that had the capability to do more than just simple calculations. Bill Gates himself tells the story in his book, Source Code, My Beginnings. Picture this, it's a cold, slushy Boston day in the winter of 1974. Bill writes, then Paul burst into my room. He'd run all the way from out of town news and was panting. There was slush on his boots. Remember what you told me? He said. What? You said, let me know when someone comes out with a machine built around the 8080. Well, here it is. Check it out, he said, shoving a magazine into my hands. It was the January 1975 issue of Popular Electronics. That magazine cover featured the MITS Altair 8800, a computer kit built around the Intel 8080 microprocessor. It was the machine they were waiting for, and they knew immediately what it needed, a programming language. Specifically, BASIC. Why BASIC? BASIC was an easy to learn general purpose programming language that was becoming popular in universities and schools as an introduction to teaching about computers and programming. It was simple, interactive, and perfect for the kind of hobbyist machines they envisioned. But Gates and Allen weren't the only ones thinking this way. The People's Computer Company which was a hugely influential hobbyist group back then, saw the same magazine. Their January 1975 newsletter noted that, for the Altair, high level languages are being considered with BASIC at the top of the list. And things were moving fast. The very next PCC newsletter issue in March of 1975 kicked off a series called Build Your Own BASIC. They weren't just talking about it, they were showing people how to make BASIC for machines using the Intel 8008 and 8080 chips. And they introduced a concept crucial for the limited hardware of the day, Tiny BASIC. The newsletter put it charmingly, pretend you are seven years old and don't care much about floating point arithmetic. What's that? Logarithms, signs, matrix inversion, nuclear reactor calculations, and stuff like that. And, your home computer's kind of small, not too much memory. Maybe it's a Mark 8 or an Altair 8800 with less than 4K bytes and a TV typewriter for input and output. Tiny Basic was about making programming accessible on minimal hardware. Keep that in mind, it'll become important later. Now, around the same time that newsletter came out, something else significant happened. The People's Computer Company got their hands on an actual Altair 8800 review unit. To show off, Fred Moore and Gordon French organized a gathering in a garage in Menlo Park, California on March 5th. This wasn't just any gathering, it was the first meeting of the legendary Homebrew Computer Club. And who was in attendance that evening? A young hardware enthusiast working at Hewlett Packard named Steve Wozniak. Wozniak, in his autobiography, I Was, describes the scene. About 30 people showed up for this first meeting there in that garage in Menlo Park. It was cold and kind of sprinkling outside, but they left the garage door open and set up chairs inside. So I'm just sitting there, listening to the big discussion going on. They were talking about some microprocessor computer kit being up for sale, and they all seemed excited about it. Someone there was holding up the magazine Popular Electronics, which had a picture of a computer on the front of it. It was called the Altair, from a New Mexico company named MITS. 
You bought the pieces and then put them together and then you could have your own computer. That meeting and seeing the Altair sparked something in Wozniak. And at the same time, back in Boston, Gates and Allen were racing to create their basic interpreter for the Altair. Now they had some key advantages. They were familiar with BASIC from using it at Lakeside School, and Bill had, back then, already took on the challenge of building an expression parser, a key component of any programming language interpreter. And crucially, through Harvard, where Bill was a student, they had access to a powerful PDP-10 mini-computer. This allowed them to write and test their code much faster than trying to do it directly on the primitive Altair hardware. Paul Allen explained this edge in his book, Idea Man. Some have suggested that our Altair Basic was remarkable because we created it without ever seeing an Altair or even a sample Intel 8080, the microprocessor it would run on. What we did was indeed unprecedented, but what is less well understood is that we had no choice. The Altair was little more than a bare bones box with a CPU on a chip inside. It had no hard drive, no floppy disk, no place to edit or store programs. And even if the machine had been up to it, debugging on the memory challenged 8080 would have been slow and difficult at best. Any other programmers vying to bring an 8080 basic to Albuquerque would be facing an uphill climb. For starters, they'd have to realize that they needed a simulator and then to create one from scratch on a mainframe or mini computer. Bill and I had a big edge in speed and productivity with our Trafo data development tools. But could we actually write a BASIC interpreter? Their BASIC, later known as Microsoft BASIC, was ready by July of 1975. It was the first high-level language available for the Altair, and it was a game changer. Suddenly, the Altair wasn't just a box of blinking lights and toggle switches. It was a programmable computer. So, the Altair 8800 and Microsoft BASIC provided the initial spark for the home computer revolution. But a spark needs fuel to become a fire. That fuel arrived two years later in 1977 with the release of three machines that took the idea of a personal computer and made it a reality for a much wider audience. This is the 1977 Trinity. Commodore PET, the Apple II, and the TRS-80 Model 1. Each of those computers was an all-in-one, fully assembled unit with a built-in keyboard, a screen or an easy connection to one, storage to load and save programs, which in that day was a cassette tape, and crucially, the basic programming language built right in. No more complex assembly language or loading from paper tape for half an hour. And interestingly, each initially launched with a different flavor of BASIC, though their roots all trace back to that 1975 spark. So let's look at the first of the Trinity, released in January of 1977, the Commodore PET. Commodore, led by the formidable Jack Trammell, needed a BASIC for their new machine. So they went straight to the source, Bill Gates and his fledgling company, now called Microsoft. Bill Gates and Microsoft were busy porting their BASIC to every new machine they could find. Ohio Scientific, Billings, Kermemco, MSI, people don't remember these names, but like the start of any industry, there was just a flourishing of lots and lots of companies 90% of which went out of business, but we got to do the basic for all those machines. And so it was a very exciting time period where I was kind of traveling and doing the, the business stuff as well as writing uh, a lot of code. And the code had to be very small and precise uh, in those days. You know, it wasn't like you could waste, waste any memory at all. So it had a certain beauty that, um, you know, we, we were doing the best small software. For Commodore, Gates wanted a royalty deal, a payment for every pet sold. But Trammell was famously tough. He insisted on a one-time flat fee to license Microsoft Basic, with the condition that Commodore couldn't make major changes. Gates wasn't happy, but needed the deal. As the story goes, when Gates pushed for royalties, 
Tramel quipped, I'm already married. So, the pet shipped with a version of Microsoft Basic, giving it a language compatible with the one on the Altair and on a number of other machines of the time, and one with powerful floating point math capabilities right out of the gate. Now, remember Steve Wozniak at that first homebrew computer club meeting in March of 1975? Seeing the Altair, he was inspired to build his own computer based around the less expensive 6800 and then the even cheaper but mostly compatible 6502. This computer eventually became the Apple I. The Apple I initially sold as a kit computer, but after seeing BASIC running on the Altair, he knew his computer also needed BASIC to be truly useful, especially with books like 101 BASIC Computer Games becoming popular. As Waz recounts in iWaz, the computer I built didn't have a language yet. Back then, in 1975, a young guy named Bill Gates was starting to get a little bit of fame in our circles for writing a basic interpreter for the Altair. Our club had a copy of it on paper tape, which could be read in with a teletype, taking about 30 minutes to complete. Also, at around the same time, a book called 101 Basic Computer Games came out. I could sniff the air. That's why I decided BASIC would be the right language to write for the Apple I and its 6502 microprocessor. And I found out none existed for the 6502. That meant if I wrote a BASIC program for it, mine could be the first. And I might even get famous for it. People would say, oh, Steve Wozniak, he did the BASIC for the 6502. So, Steve Wozniak, the hardware guy, taught himself BASIC internals and wrote his own interpreter from scratch for the 6502 processor used in the Apple I. It was an impressive feat. To save time and memory, he made a crucial design choice. Again, in IWAS, it took me about four months to come up with the core of my basic interpreter. I ended up leaving out the ability to type in decimal numbers, called floating point arithmetic, and instead handled everything with integers, that is, whole numbers. That saved me about a month of work, I figured. I decided that for games and computer simulations, the two main things I was writing the basic for, I would just get by with integers. Many of the key programs in my life, including those back in Colorado, used only integers. So I designed my basic to only work with numbers from minus 32,768 to positive 32,787. The Apple I sold so well that Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs got to work designing and building a personal computer that would be easier to use and more complete, including having a case and a built-in keyboard. That computer became the second computer of the 1977 Trinity, the Apple II. And the Apple II used the same integer basic that Wozniak had programmed for the Apple I, though this time it was built into the ROMs when the Apple II launched in June of 1977. It was fast and efficient for games and simple programs, perfectly matching Waz's initial goals. But unlike the PET, the Apple II didn't start with Microsoft Basic. The third member of the Trinity, released shortly after the Apple II in August of 1977, was the Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1. Tandy Corporation owned Radio Shack, a massive chain of electronic stores popular across the U.S. They saw the potential of personal computers and they wanted in. They hired a bright engineer named Steve Leininger to lead the project. Leininger had come from National Semiconductor, where he'd worked with their 8-bit SCMP processor that competed with the 8080 and 6502. Like Wozniak, Leininger was also a homebrew computer club member and a reader of the People's Computer Company newsletters. Remember the tiny basic from People's Computer Company newsletter? It had really taken off. Its small size and simplicity made it ideal for hobbyists. The concept became so popular it spawned its own publication, spun off from the original PCC newsletter. It was initially called Dr. Dobbs Journal of Tiny Basic, Calisthenics, and Orthodontia, running light without overbite. It was a humorous call out to Tiny Basic which was why it was initially created. Dr. Dobbs eventually became the place for sharing code and programming techniques, 
starting with tiny basic implementations. Steve Leininger, while at National Semiconductor, had even co-written a tiny basic for the SCMP chip and published the source code in Dr. Dobbs in late 1976. This was the November-December 1976 issue of Dr. Dobbs. NIBL came into this world as an interpreter for Tiny Basic, as originally described in the first issue of Dr. Dobbs' journal. That program was written by Steve Leininger, who subsequently left before the program was ever assembled or executed. He left to go to Tandy. Tandy hired Leininger because they were impressed by his work at National Semiconductor, and they wanted him to design their entry in the new personal computer market. But he couldn't bring the National Semiconductor Basic that he had helped write with him due to copyright. But he needed a basic and fast, and one that would fit in the limited ROM space Tandy had budgeted. So he turned back to the tiny basic community and Dr. Dobbs' journal. Since they had settled on using the Zilog Z80, a CPU mostly compatible with the Intel 8080, they turned to one particularly well-regarded implementation for the 8080, Li Chen Wang's Palo Alto Tiny Basic. It was small, efficient, yet included features like 4NX loops, making it quite capable. Li Chen Wang, like Leininger, was also a Homebrew Computer Club member, and he was a big proponent of sharing software. His basic wasn't copyrighted. It famously had a copyleft notice with all wrongs reserved, a playful jab at the traditional all rights reserved, and perhaps a reaction to Bill Gates's controversial open letter to hobbyists, which had condemned software piracy and angered many in the free sharing homebrew community. So, Steve Leininger took Lee Chen Wang's freely available Palo Alto Tiny Basic, heavily modified and expanded it, and that became Level 1 Basic, built into the ROM of the initial TRS-80 Model 1. It was small and used a simple floating point implementation, but it got the job done, and along with Tandy's nationwide network of Radio Shack stores, helped make the TRS-80 incredibly popular. So let's recap. By the end of 1977, the personal computer fire was burning brightly, fueled by these three seminal machines. The Commodore PET, launched with Microsoft Basic, initially written in Harvard's computer center and dorm rooms on a PDP-10 simulating an 8080. The Apple II, launched with Steve Wozniak's own integer basic, handwritten and debugged on a notepad and typed into the Apple I using hexadecimal. And the TRS-80 Model 1, launched with Steve Leininger's heavily modified version of Lee Chen Wang's Tiny Basic, originally published in Dr. Dobbs. Three different machines, three different basics, but all born from the same primordial soup stirred up by the Altair and the hobbyist communities like the People's Computer Company and the Homebrew Computer Club. They brought computing out of computer rooms and expensive labs and into homes, schools, and small businesses. But the story doesn't end there. While these were the initial basics, the landscape shifted quickly. Microsoft Basic, with its powerful features, including floating point math, eventually became the de facto standard. And within just two years, both the Apple II's integer basic and the TRS-80's level one basic would largely be replaced by, you guessed it, versions of Microsoft Basic. How did Microsoft manage to dominate the basic market? Why did Apple and Tandy eventually adopt their competitor's version of the basic language? Well, that's a story for the next time. If you want to find out how Microsoft Basic conquered the Trinity and cemented its place in PC history, or if you just like learning about the history of personal computers and programming, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss our next episode. And I want to hear from you. What are your memories of BASIC? Did you learn to program on one of those early machines like I did? Did you use Integer BASIC or Level 1 BASIC or maybe one of the many other tiny BASIC variants out there? Let me know down in the comments below. I really do love reading about your experiences. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.